And up next, we have Dr. Paul Kimmel, a Rutgers chem professor, speaking about the different ways to achieve happiness, spiritual versus scientific. Please welcome to the stage. I see these guys talked about a fortune. I ain't got a fortune too. Happiness is not a reward, it's a consequence. That's what I just got. <laughs> and that reminds me of a bumper sticker, actually from the uh, person who was talking about materialism. I remember a bumper sticker I saw a while back which said, happiness isn't everything, it can't buy money. <laughs> but in any case, uh, you know, the topic today is the pursuit of happiness, and I, I, I'm thinking back where that phrase comes from. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You all know where that comes from, right guys? As a teacher, I asked my class here. The Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. It was revolutionary at the time. We are all entitled to life. We are entitled to liberty. We are entitled to happiness. No, it doesn't say that. It has that wonderful phrase, the pursuit of happiness. It's part of our American culture, in a way, the expression of the American ideal. Every person has a chance to pursue his dreams. Happiness is neither defined nor guaranteed, but we all have the opportunity to find our own version of it. Of course, our dreams, aspirations, what we call happiness, are different for each person. Consider the Walt Whitman poem. Oh, oh okay, the first click gives me my title. Let's try the next one. Oh, there's a, a poem that you might have seen in your class. I actually did this in some of my uh, chem classes at the end of the year. When I heard, it's called, it's called the first line, when I heard the learned astronomer, Walt Whitman, and leaves the press. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures, were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. To Whitman, happiness is the spiritual enjoyments. Well, there it is. That's Whitman's spiritual enjoyment. That's the Andromeda Galaxy, I think. To, Whit to Whitman, ha happiness is the spiritual enjoyment of the beauty of the stars, the vastness, the enormity of a universe without boundaries, whereas the scientist, the astronomer, is just a boring drone of tables, graphs, equations. Can there be any happiness there? Apparently not for Walt Whitman, but behind the equations, the tables and graphs, there might be an exciting discovery, a law, a theory verified, a suggestion of new research to be done in understanding the universe. That's excitement, interest, the scientist's version of happiness. And could that learned astronomer not enjoy the stars as Whitman does, go out for a walk, perhaps holding hands with his wife, and just appreciate the beauty of a clear starry night? With knowledge of how the stars work, each one is a nuclear furnace, changing hydrogen to helium at a tremendous rate, would that knowledge interfere with his spiritual enjoyment? No. There's no reason why this should diminish the appreciation of the beauty of the starry night. It just adds another level of understanding. It doesn't take away, it enhances, it adds. Well, consider a hike in the mountains. It's a nice mountain scene. You can enjoy the magnificent trees, the clouds, the clean air, the views, the streams, the rocky slopes. But let's suppose you're a geologist who studies how these mountains were formed by uplifting of the Earth's faults and with further studies how these streams carry pebbles and silt and are slowly eroding the mountain, perhaps can calculate how long it would take to erode the mountain down to, the, down to normal levels. Does this knowledge detract from the enjoyment of the hike? No, it enhances, it adds. I'm now a chemistry teacher at Rutgers University that I taught at East Brunswick High School for 42 years. And I sometimes try to enhance my lessons by looking at subject matter from a different point of view. In the AP chemistry curriculum, thermodynamics is an important topic. In particular, the second law of thermodynamics, which predicts which reactions are possible, known as thermodynamically favor favorable. When a reaction proceeds, it loses available energy, called free energy, and energy is changed from more useful to less useful forms. The entropy of the universe increases. There are a number of formulas and equations mathematically describe the situation. In fact, the top one there is a mathematical formula. 
And the second one is a sort of an English summary of it. And the third is metaphorical. Entropy is time's arrow. And that's what I uh, uh, emphasized in the, in the lesson. On a human level, the result is somewhat depressing. The steady increase of the entropy of the universe means everything runs down. Nothing lasts forever, time's arrow. I used to incorporate a class which included literary allusions to the second law, both in prose and poetry. One of the poems I used to discuss was Limited by Carl Sandburg. I am riding on a limited express, one of the crack trains of the nation. Hurtling across the prairie into blue haze and dark air go 15 all steel coaches holding a thousand people. And then he has a phrase in parentheses, as in by the way. All the coaches shall be scrap and rust, and all the men and women laughing in the diners and sleepers shall pass to ashes. And he goes back to the regular. I ask a man in the smoker where he is going, and he answers, Omaha. This poem from the 1930s is obviously well before modern technology or the computer age, even before air travel was common. So before presenting the poem, I would briefly explain what a crack train or limited express meant for students who knew nothing more than New Jersey Transit or Amtrak. Even the reference to the smoker seems very dated, thankfully. Of course, the dark humor in the poem is in the parenthetical phrase and the final answer to the question. When the man asks where he is going, he answers Omaha. That is his immediate, not his final destination, which is indicated in the parenthetical phrase. Nothing lasts forever. No one lives forever. The second law of thermodynamics will win in the end. Well, I'm trying to get the next slide here. There's the nice shiny train, and what happens to everyone or everything at the end is there. The second law of thermodynamics will win out at the end. I was a chemistry teacher at East Brunswick High School for 42 years, but also participated in musical activities, such as being the advisor of Musicians Club, <coughs> playing in the pit band for high school musicals. I made it a tradition to give a piano concert for all my chemistry classes the day before it went to break. These concerts were purely for the enjoyment of the music. There wasn't any science lesson involved, but of course there is a science of sound. Each note is a certain frequency of vibration. A, and that's an A above middle C, is 440 cycles per second, and that's middle C, 256 cycles per second. Each octave, from C to C, or D to D, has a frequency of double the lower note. That's why you perceive the octave, double the frequency. There are 12 semitones in an octave, and you can see it here. If you count from one note and count 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, to get to the octave. And remember, the octave is double the frequency, so I'm doing some teaching now, something that it, what's made me happy for many years. Uh, so the, the frequency ratio for the octave is 2 to 1, and the frequency ratio for the semitone is the 12th root of 2, which is 1.059. So that each semitone, each adjacent note, has 1.059 times the frequency of the lower note. So the octave ratio of 2 to 1 is reached after the 12th semitone. The 12th root of 2 multiplied by itself 12 times, or 1.059 taken to the 12th power. Now I'm not thinking about any of this when I'm actually playing, say, a Beethoven sonata or Chopin nocturne. Then I'm concentrating on the music and its emotional power. But knowledge of the system of tuning in no way detracts from my ability to perform. It's just another layer of understanding. It enhances. It adds. I mentioned some poems before. Now I'm going to end with a prose uh, selection the, from The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, which states the theory of natural selection underlying the principle behind evolution, considered one of the most important books in biology the culmination of years of research and thinking. Darwin's last paragraph of this book, trying to get it here. I had it. Uh, Darwin's last paragraph of the book is a model of beautiful writing, eloquent writing, an illustrative of how the scientist can find spiritual fulfillment, happiness if you want to call it that, in his search for understanding. The last paragraph of The Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object of which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, 
from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. There are many roads, intellectual and spiritual, on which we pursue happiness, and they are not mutually exclusive. For maximum enjoyment, for maximum happiness, for maximum understanding, we can try to approach a subject from many different points of view. And we can be thankful that in this country, the United States of America, we are free to pursue happiness in our own way. <laughs>